Hello, Jemima. We can begin. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Our presenter is Jason Keruja, a pediatric nurse a pediatric nurse by profession. He has been in the field for the last 15 years and above. So we have vast experience in pediatric area. He has worked in many protocol development, one of them being ETAT protocol, which we are going to be focusing today. It is one of the tools that we use to assess our children in the hospital and even out of the hospital setup. So today I welcome Jason Keruja to take us through the updates of Pediatric Protocol 2022. Welcome, Jason. Thank you, Thank you Janima, for the introduction. Uh, so we are focusing on the, a small part of the new basic pediatric protocol, and that is the part on oxygen therapy. So this is uh, the work around oxygen and the basic pediatric protocol has uh, come to fruition because of the work of many uh, partners, the Ministry of Health, the University of Nairobi, our Kenyatta National Hospital, Clinton Health Access Initiative, I mean, among many other partners who have made the basic pediatric protocol a reality. So for today, we are just going to focus on the oxygen part, the new inclusions, with additions of other materials to enhance our utilization of oxygen in the hospital. So, especially among children. So we have our fifth edition of the basic pediatric protocol. It will be launched this month. So it will be the November, 2022. So it's quite latest. It's much bigger than the previous editions. It has more content. Uh, so we'll be able to be sharing this booklet as uh, soon once it is signed as the soft copy, uh, even before you wait for the printed copies. So the new booklet has uh, many additions. It has uh, uh, DKA management is part of the new inclusions to the booklet. Uh, treatment for conversions, you have new medications added to the booklet. So it, it's a nice booklet to have and uh, to use. A lot of changes in newborn care. So uh, have, have a look at it. And today we are going to highlight some of the inclusions, uh, especially about oxygen in the new booklet. So the outline of my talk today will uh, focus on hypoxemia, uh, detection of hypoxemia, and the indications for oxygen uh, use. Then we're going to look at the oxygen uh, delivery devices and the accessories that we need when you're delivering oxygen. Monitoring of uh, oxygen is a new inclusion in the basic pediatric protocol. We are going to see how we are going to, to start titrating the oxygen to increase the dosage or when we need to reduce the oxygen uh, dosage and even stop administration. Not in the protocol, but will be part of our discussion today is we're going to discuss sources of oxygen and safety in oxygen administration. So just defining some of the common terminologies that we are using. Uh, so it's uh, hypoxemia is low levels of oxygen in blood. So hypoxia is low oxygen in the tissues. So SpO2 is a measurement uh, of uh, arterial blood uh, saturation with oxygen uh, done by use of a pulse oximeter and it's given as a percentage. And we say somebody having hypoxemia when the SpO2 is less than 90. 
Zoosol so saturation of arterial oxygen, SCO2, is another measure that is also used. And this one usually uses uh, arterial blood, and it's also it's 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 it, it, um, and, and it it compares with SpO2. So SpO2 being uh, easier to use, it's an invasive. You don't have to bleed the patient, so it becomes a quicker way of estimating oxygen saturation. So we'll. Uh, we have our oxygen, uh, we have our pulse oximeters, uh, which are gadgets which are used to measure the percentage of oxygen saturation in arterial blood uh, peripherally. You don't have to draw a blood uh, sample, which uses a light source. And this light source, and also a sensor or a, 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 a photo detector, is usually at the end of the pulse oximeter probe. So other guide gadgets that you're going to have a look at later, you'll see the high flow nasal cannula systems, some of the gadgets used to deliver high flow oxygen, even to flow rates of 40 to 60 liters per minute. CPAP is available in most of our hospitals now, and it is continuous positive airway pressure. And we are going to note, uh, we are also going to discuss when we need to escalate care from the non-invasive ways of delivering oxygen to the invasive ways of delivering oxygen. It's good for us to be able to note this so that you'll be able to escalate care early when the patient can still benefit from the advanced care. So hypoxemia, it's of importance to us. This is the low oxygen uh, levels in blood because once we have hypoxemia, it increases the case fatality uh, of most of the conditions that affect our patient. So if you if 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 you have pneumonia, pneumonia on its own risk of death is seven percent. Then if you have hypoxemia with it, the risk increases to 19 percent. So the same for uh, other conditions, uh, malaria, even neonatal encephalopathy. So hypoxemia increases the case fatality rate of uh, most of the conditions our patients present with. So it's something we need to be looking out for and treating. So uh, it has been found it's, uh, that improving oxygen systems can reduce um, child pneumonia, especially the severe forms of pneumonia, uh, mortality in hospitals by approximately 50% and uh, reduce other deaths uh, by 25%. So it's an intervention that is key to us and it, it, uh, it improves our care if delivered well. As we are going to see later, oxygen is a drug like any other drug and we'll focus on its uh, prescription and correct administration without giving underdose or overdose. So oxygen is also used quite widely in the hospital. Most of our departments use oxygen. So in case you're from the ambulance to the emergency department, in the wards, in the theater, in the newborn unit, and uh, in the intensive care unit. So being a drug that is widely used, uh, a medication that is widely, widely used. So it's important that we be able to use it correctly and we be able to speak the same language across the hospital. So indications for oxygen. So we're going to look at uh, detecting the patient who needs oxygen, that is uh, diagnosing patient who needs um, oxygen and those who could be having hypoxemia. So these are page in the basic uh, pediatric protocol. It has our ABCD approach, which we use for patients who have signs of life, the patient who have not collapsed. Those unwell patients, it gives you a systematic way of uh, looking at the patient and uh, starting from safety 
stimulate if the patient is not alert, calling for help if the patient is not alert, and being in a setting where you're able to provide emergency care. Uh, taking care of the airway, sanctioning if need be. And then today we are going to devote a lot of time on the breathing assessment, because that's when we need oxygen as an intervention. And all is, uh, the other thing you'll need is uh, also a bronchodilator, is, is a wheeze. It's also administered as you check the breathing. So this is a page in the basic pediatric protocol. It was there in the previous versions, but with some improvement in the new version. Inclusion of O of E. We are not initially emphasizing on the exposure bit. So there is also need to have a quick head to toe examination of the patient and being able to note any abnormalities which could uh, inform further management of your patient. So it's just uh, mentioning that uh, we are going to focus on the breathing part. So this is just our four S's and the A, B, C, D, E. So you can be able to see our four S's. We see this is a systematic approach, approach um, to all our patients. Um, regardless of what they are presenting with, this system will always uh, guide you. Even if it's a, collapse, uh, a, a convulsing child, you can still follow the ABCDE approach. So for every step, we usually encourage that you, using your senses, you're going to look, inspect. So as you inspect, you're looking for the respiratory rate. In case we are checking for the work of breathing, looking for any head nodding, expose the chest and check if there is lower chest or in drawing checking for flaring, okay? So you're listening for grunting, so then you can auscultate for wheeze, crackles. You can also note if the chest is unusually silent, especially in a, an asthmatic attack that can tell you there's a big problem. So Hello, that just we, this one, sorry for interrupting. Yes. We are getting a report that your volume is a, a bit low. Okay. So is it better now? Just a moment. Is it better now? Try again. Can you hear me now? Is it better? Is it better? Can you hear me now? Okay, so I get signal that uh, it's better. So yeah, so I'll, I'll thank you for that. So let, yeah, so usually uh, it's always good to check if uh, there are other complications in the chest, that's why you always feel for trachea and a position and do further assessment if you're worried of complications like uh, tension pneumothorax. So uh, correcting problems at breathing, it usually needs to uh, give oxygen. So we'll going to look into the details of supplementation of oxygen and need to position the patient in the best possible, um, in, in, in the good, best comfortable position or you prop them up. And then if they are, there's, uh, there's asthma, then you need to give the medications and the nebulizers, the bronchodilators. Then if the patient is so unwell with altered consciousness and poor respiratory effort, maybe breathing at a very slow rate, then you may need to uh, ventilate the patient using your bag valve mask device. So remember oxygen is, uh, administration is just supplementing the need for oxygen and oxygen on its own does not treat the underlying condition. So always be on the lookout for the, uh, always look out for the underlying uh, condition and treat 
So if it's pneumonia, you'll have your antibiotics early. Okay, so if they need for bronchodilators and corticosteroid in severe asthma, you'll need to, to use them early. And then we'll see later how to escalate care if there's need for that. So remember, oxygen is not treating the underlying problem. Look out for that problem and treat it accordingly. Uh, so in case you don't have a pulse oximeter, a child who presents with any of these uh, signs, you need to start them on oxygen even before you do your uh, pulse oximetry. So this slide has uh, been used also in the eat at plus trainings, and there's a lot of evidence supporting the use of these clinical signs to be able to pick the patient that need oxygen. So patient with central cyanosis, that is cyanosis, uh, the, the bluish coloration in the gums and the tongue, start them on oxygen. Patient with grunting, start them on oxygen. Patient who have head nodding, uh, that means they are using the muscles of the neck to try to breathe in as much as possible, start them on oxygen. Patient with severe lower chest wall in drawing, start them on oxygen. Patient with the fast breathing of rates more than 70, start them on oxygen. So patient who have altered consciousness plus any sign of respiratory distress, start them on oxygen. So, um, so we said this is in case you don't have a pulse oximeter and you don't need a reason, you need when to start oxygen. So these clinical signs can guide you, okay? Then wheeze and inability to talk could be indication of uh, severe asthma. We also need to start them on oxygen. So you can also consider oxygen in patients who have deep acidotic breathing. Acidotic breathing can be caused by many conditions, especially if that condition could be something like anemia, then you may need to also start them on oxygen. So remember, uh, as we're going to see later, that uh, pulse oximetry is really needed because you miss some patients who could be having hypoxemia if you don't have a pulse oximeter. So we have uh, conditions which are associated with hypoxemia. So within the neonates, uh, remember, um, we have the respiratory problems that are causing us the uh, need for supplementing oxygen uh, that are causing respiratory problems so, uh, the, and giving us need to start uh, oxygen. So these uh, respiratory problems can also be split into uh, the lung tissue problems like pneumonia, the airway problems like asthma. So remember, this, you can be able to, as you start oxygen, you're trying to figure out where is the problem. Is it a diffusion deficit problem like in pneumonia where the lung tissue are affected? Is it an airway problem? Uh, either narrowing of the airway, either due to bronchiolitis or asthma, then you need to start the to start the treating the underlying problem from the early group. Is it a systemic uh, problem? Uh, could it be a poisoning? Could it be the brain injury, could it be a, a overdose of a, a medication? So you're trying to figure out is 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 the is is the problem originating from the brain? We have depressed breathing due to a brain problem, or is the lungs and the airways that have the problem? So as you treat, you're trying to figure out where is the cause. Is it an upper airway? a lower airway problem? Is it an obstruction problem of the airways or the blood vessels leading to the lung? So you can be able always to figure out as you attend and assess the patient where the problem could be. So this slide uh, just uh, reminds us some of the conditions that are associated with, with, uh, with, with hypoxemia. Uh, and uh, remember to always assess and as you try to figure out where the problem is. So 
there. So we've mentioned that uh, you always need the combination of the clinical signs and pulse oximeter to pick more hypoxemia uh, cases. So if you use clinical signs alone, there's a chance you can miss up to 40% of hypoxemic patients. So combining clinical signs with pulse oximeter is, is um, the best thing to do. So uh, pulse oximetry is, we said it's quite quick and uninvasive. It's quite reliable and also a globally accepted method for healthcare workers to diagnose hypoxemia. So, and then it also gives you the, the, the rate, the pulse rate as it's giving you the, and it's giving you the oxygen saturation. And we said the uh, hypoxemia is SpO2 less than 90%. So uh, other way of also detecting hypoxemia is use of blood gas analysis. So you need to get an, especially an arterial sample. It's, uh, it's an invasive procedure that uh, you need to collect blood and it measures the partial pressure of oxygen and it, it gives you the advantage of uh, getting carbon dioxide. That also tells us about not only oxygenation, but also tells us about how oxygen, uh, how a patient is ventilating. Are they getting rid of uh, carbon dioxide and also gives you the pH Okay, sorry about that small drop. We can continue. So we've looked at uh, detecting hypoxemia, looking at the clinical signs and the uh, use of pulse oximetry. Uh, next, we are going to look at the oxygen delivery devices that we, that we can use, especially among the children. So, so they are, these are the sum of the devices we use. So this is a nasal prompts. We have an Andre breather mask. We have the high flow nasal cannula system. We have a CPAP machine and a mechanical ventilator. So in the new uh, protocol that the, the 2020 basic pediatric protocol, there is now inclusion of the photos for for the gadgets that we use to deliver oxygen to children. So we have the nasal probes. So the images were not there in the previous sessions. So we have a nasal catheter and even how to how to size uh, the nasal catheter and we have the non rebreather mask. So these are the gadgets we commonly use to deliver oxygen to children. So especially the nasoprom tolerated well by most of the children, doesn't cover the face, especially the children who are, who are alert, then putting something in their face becomes distressing. So nasoprom is well tolerated by our patients. So the standard flow rate for nasoprom, for neonate, we are starting at half a liter to one liter. Uh, per minute as the flow rate. So for infant is one to two liters. Uh, so infant is children uh, ab from above the neonatal age to one year. 
So those are infant, you can use one to two liters. And uh, anyone above that age is one to four liters. So this is the standard flow. So every time we are talking about administration and even as we measure our SpO2, always, men, always remember to mention the concentration of oxygen the patient is receiving. That is the FiO2, the fraction of inspired oxygen. So the nasoprong delivers to the patient about that 5% oxygen to the patient. Room air is 21% oxygen. So when you're supplementing oxygen using nasoprong, you're adding to, to the room air concentration and you hope to deliver about 35% oxygen to the patient. So then you'll see the need for that because when you'll come to either titrating or uh, changing from one mode to the other, you need to, you'll be knowing how much more oxygen you're giving. So you can uh, also use the nasoprongs to deliver high flow uh, oxygen. And for preterm, high flow rate is a maximum of one liter. For term baby, is a, you can go to two liters per minute as the flow rate. For infants and children, you can give higher flow rates of four to eight liters per minute. Yeah, so with the nasoprongs, you, you must humidify the oxygen when you're using high flow rate. You may not humidify when you're using the standard flow rate. So the high flow rate delivers a higher concentration of oxygen, the FiO2 of 50% to the patient. So, you, so it gives a higher concentration of patient than the standard flow rate. So the high flow rate oxygen, you need to monitor more closely. So these are the patient who may need to be in an acute room or in an HBU kind of setup. So you don't want to use low flow rate. Um, you use high flow rate for the patient you can't monitor adequately. So there's a risk of, uh, of, of um, gastric inflation. So you always need to be watching this patient carefully. It's like also the same way as CPAP. So the same monitoring you'll do for CPAP is the same monitoring you would do for high flow uh, uh, nasal prongs. So always, also always ensure that the airways are clear. Uh, use a few drops of saline into the nostrils if they are dry, and also if they have secretions to to if they have uh, dry sec uh, dry uh, uh, particles in their nostrils, you may need to use a few drops of saline and sanction to clear the the airway. Also, just a few drops also helps in uh, keeping the nostrils uh, moist uh, and also makes your insertion of the prongs easier. So nasal catheter, the, uh, so you insert, you use a catheter, an, an oxygen catheter, looks like a feeding tube. So you, you measure from the side of the nose to the inner margin of the eyebrow, that's the distance that you go. And, um, and, and yeah, strap it and you connect it to the, an oxygen tubing. So that nasal catheter, you, you'd, you use it for infant and children and at the standard flow of one to two liters per minute. They are not recommended for neonics. So you can use the nasal catheter. And if, uh, if you suspect any, if you notice any gastric inflation, either when you're using high flow uh, or the nasal catheter, it's good to insert an gastric tube and leave it open to get any oxygen that goes to the stomach out. Then note that if you're to this patient on a nasal catheter, if they are to be having an NG tube uh, and nasogastric tube, it's good that you insert them 
the nasogastric tube and the nasal catheter on the same nostril. So the nasal catheter delivers a concentration of about 40%. So, but nowadays, I think most of the hospitals have good numbers of nasoprom, and you may not need to use the nasal catheter if you have the nasoprom. So but, uh, then the other gadget we use to deliver oxygen to children is the non rebreather mask. So it's the oxygen mask and it has a reservoir bag and it has valves. It has three valves, uh, two on the side and one from the bag. Do not remove these valves. They help in in, in making sure the patient is breathing high concentration of oxygen. So the flaps, the, the ventilation valves on the outside, they open when the patient is breathing out and they close when the patient is breathing in so that the patient utilizes the oxygen from the bag. So it delivers a higher concentration above 80% of uh, the FiO2 of above 80% to the patient. So always make sure that the bag is full, is inflated as you give the oxygen. The flow rate, you need a good source of oxygen because you need a flow rate of 10 to 15 liters per minute. Do not give flow rates less than 10. It will be like suffocating the patient. So you need higher flow rates. You need higher flow rates. So you need a flow rate of... of uh, 10 to 15. So, yeah, so you've looked at the gadgets to deliver oxygen. So, you can look at other accessories we need to deliver oxygen to the patient. I've said this page is in the new pediatric protocol, and once it's out, it can be a good uh, reference uh, for use in our clinical area. So the oxygen accessories that we can use, we're going to have a look that we usually use them in our clinical area. So we usually use, um, so we usually have um, gas uh, cylinder valve. So it's usually the, it comes with a cylinder and it's a valve that, uh, that we use uh, the oxygen kit open. So some can come with, um, with this thing that looks like a pump, this the handle, the spindle handle, or opener for the key, for the valve. Or if it doesn't have that, you can use the oxygen keys, key that you use to open up the valve. So the, uh, the valve allows oxygen to be pushed in when you're refilling, and also uh, when you open, it allows oxygen out. So, but this oxygen is compressed and at a very high uh, pressure. So when you open this valve, the, the oxygen can gush out and usually comes out under very high pressure. So to control that pressure, the oxygen is coming out with, you use the oxygen uh, pressure regulator. So you have a regulator which is attached to the valve so that you'll be able now to control the pressure it comes out. So the regulator usually also have a gauge which tells you how much oxygen is in the, it's what much pressure and that also tells us how much oxygen is in the cylinder. So these are some of the accessories that you usually require to use oxygen. So usually will require your regulator and you require your oxygen key uh, to give oxygen. So the, we have the valve, the regulator goes to the valve and then the flow meter goes to the regulator. So we have the valve, regulator, flow meter. So the flow meter goes into the, into the, so we have the flow meter here going into the valve and then the flow meter now allows you to, 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 to measure or to give the dosage that you need for your patient. And then attached to the flow meter is also the humidifier bottle where you put the distilled water. 
So the flow meter usually has a ball, a rotating ball inside it. And we usually read the ball from the middle of the ball, of this boy. It is a floating boy that is in the cylinder, in the, in the flow meter. And we make our reading from the middle of the boy. So please note, there are some other designs which you may need to read at the top. They are usually like an arrow pointed downwards. And for those ones, you will need to read from the top. So always check with the supplier. But for the ball ones, the floating ball, the rotating ball, you always read from the middle of the ball. But if it's not a ball that is inside the flow meter, then you'll always have to need to, to check, to check um, the, the device that you have, how to read it correctly. So you said the pointed ones, which looks like an narrow pointing downwards, you read at from the top of that arrow. But for the boy, the rotating ball, you read from the middle of the of the boy of the the floating device. So we have the flow meters that goes into the wall socket. So the, there is um, also we, many of us um, was struggle to fit these into the socket. Uh, the ones being fitted nowadays, they are easy to operate. So you just need to align this this uh, a groove on the is a groove on the on the flow meter that goes into the wall socket for the piped oxygen. So you align that groove with a pin inside the socket, and you just push in your you just push in the flow meter until it clicks. So to remove, you don't pull out is the outer margin of the socket, you push it in to release the flow meter. Okay, so, and usually all these gadgets, even the, the, the regulator and the flow meter, uh, they are designed so that you use minimum strength to attach. And when you find yourself using either extra spanners or too much force, then there's something wrong somewhere and you need your equipment to be checked by your biomed engineer. So usually also to push in, you also need uh, uh, not too much force, just need to align the groove on the flow meter with a pin in the socket and you push it in. To remove, you push the outer uh, margin of the, of, 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 uh, of the wall socket for the piped oxygen to release the flow meter. So always uh, for all this equipment, you don't need too much force. So if you find yourself needing too much force, there's something wrong. And sometimes we trap oxygen within the flow meter, especially when you're using the cylinder. So you open the cylinder, you, you attach the regulator and your flow meter into the cylinder then you open the, using the key, you open the valve and you use your oxygen. Then you close from the, from the flow meter and you trap, usually you trap some pressure inside the regulator. So that pressure makes it quite difficult to remove your regulator once you're done using oxygen. So once you've uh, closed the valve using your key, always make sure that you've released any pressure by opening the flow meter so that you don't have any pressure trapped inside the regulator, making it very difficult to, to release. Okay, so you find people now trying to look for spanners to open while it's just the builder for pressure, which you just need to release by opening the flow meter. So we've uh, seen uh, some of the, um, uh, sometimes you may need to administer oxygen to more than one patient. And, and uh, we need to have a safe way of delivering oxygen to more than one patient. So use of uh, this, uh, we call it the octopus. We have a bottle with the tubes going in it and each tube is going to a patient and the oxygen is from a cylinder. So this practice, you waste a lot of oxygen 
you don't actually know what is going to each of the patient and there's leakage of oxygen and we'll see later it's not as safe it's not safe in many angles so you're wasting oxygen it's not safe for the facility in case of any fire hazard so you also don't know how much you're delivering to each of the patient so this, this is not a safe practice and uh, alternative is using oxygen splitters so these oxygen splitters uh, so like this uh, splitter they are quite now getting more and more affordable for for hospitals and they are locally available so it's getting uh, the splitters like this can um, you can control what each of the patient is getting and you can administer uh, oxygen safely to five patients from one source could be one cylinder so then also we also have this other type of splitter uh, so this was made by an engineering team from one of the hospital but even the one which is available commercially looks something similar to this so that you're able to split oxygen from one cylinder and you are able to give to four patients and these patients have their flow meter so you can know how much each patient is getting and this patient had a uh, humidifying bottle if they need humidified oxygen so we need to keep advocating and uh, alerting our teams that um, there are now better and safer ways to deliver oxygen to the patient and this includes use of splitters so uh, we've been giving oxygen now i think it's quite also important to continue monitoring the oxygen therapy we just started oxygen administration now we look into monitoring this oxygen therapy so in this is a page in the 2022 basic pediatric protocol it was not uh, there in the previous editions so it is there in our fifth edition of the basic pediatric protocol so the this page gives us guidance on how to continue giving oxygen and also to monitor the oxygen use so once we've detected the need for oxygen we had made a diagnosis of hypoxemia we have our absolute indications for oxygen here and spo2 less than 90 so you start our oxygen we have seen the gadgets to use giving the giving the and and the, the concentration that also are set for those gadgets so either the nasoprong nasocatheter or non rebreather mask so now we have our target saturations which we'll be looking at as you monitor our oxygen therapy so we have a, a 91 the target saturation we have 91 to 95 percent for new needs then we have 90 to 95 percent of the spo2 for the older children and usually after resuscitation we aim for 94 to 98 percent oxygen saturation for patient on oxygen so if the patient is on supplemental oxygen these are our targets okay so we are going to look at ways of, uh, of titrating we are titrating every 15 to 30 minutes and by half a liter as we see if we are reaching our targeted saturation uh, an easier way to remember is that you are changing your oxygen flow rate by half a liter every half an hour half a liter every half an hour for example if you got a patient who has a spo2 of of 89 or maybe 87 percent and you start them on oxygen via nisoprom maybe it's a um, two-year-old child and you start oxygen via nisoprom so nisoprom we are to do our standard flow of one to two liters you start at one liter then 30 minutes later you assess your patient and check if the sp how the spo2 is if it's within the target for 90 to 95 so if you're not yet there you increase by half a liter if your child has started one to one liter so now you can increase at half a liter to 1.5 liters per minute 
I'm using that as an example of a scenario that you can have. Then half an hour later, you come and assess and check if you have gotten to our targeted uh, saturation of 90 to 95. So if they are still below 90, then you can increase by another half a liter to two liters per minute now. And then you could be able to, every half an hour, you'll be able to check and increase. So this allows for initial um, monitoring of the patient who needs oxygen and you are able to now titrate. So to titrate is the incremental increase of oxygen. So within that time, if now uh, after you've been titrating, so the next uh, question is to check if the targeted saturation have been achieved as you keep going. Before you get to the maximum for that gadget, you're checking if the saturations have been achieved. If the saturations have been achieved, you maintain the oxygen flow rate as you monitor the SpO2 and the signs that were there that were telling us if there was increased work of breathing. So again, a reminder that you need to treat any underlying problem. So if there was no change on the other side, if there was no change into oxygen saturations, the, you did not, maybe there was change, but you did not get to the targeted saturation, then you may need to change the oxygen delivery method um, as appropriate. So if you had started with our nasoprong and we got into the maximum flow rate for that age, then you may need to change from nasoprongs to non rebreather mask and see, because now you're increasing the FiO2, you're increasing the concentration of oxygen that you're delivering. Then you continue titrating and check if the oxygen saturation has been achieved. If it has been achieved, then you maintain the oxygen flow rate for the new gadget. Then you continue monitoring the SpO2 if it remains within the target and also check if we still have the signs that prompted us to start on oxygen if there is increased work of breathing. Then if still with the new gadget, maybe you have upgraded to an and rebreather mask and still there is no, it, still you have not achieved the saturations that you had hoped to achieve, then this is the time you need to refer to escalate the care. So that means you may need to refer the patient for advanced care to where they may need to have a high flow nasocannular oxygen or CPAP or mechanical ventilation. For all these levels, always remember to treat any underlying medical problem. So you want to escalate. If the patient still is not um, saturating accord with all the gadgets that you're having, escalate the care. So for patient, for hospitals with pediatric ICU, so this, this is a patient you'll need to start looking into advanced care. And for patient without, you can now, you have a reason to, to start thinking of referral to places where they have pediatric ICU. Okay. So uh, again, on this other side, you'll continue always to monitor the patient. And if the patient uh, still, they are not achieving the targeted saturations according to their age, and they still have increased work of breathing. So you will need to consider advanced care. So you always have to consider the advanced care. So if the patient remains stable, SpO2 is high, and there is no increased work of breathing, then that is the time we start weaning off oxygen. So we are weaning off with the same rate, half a liter every half an hour. So you now start going down as you monitor. So reduce by half a liter and monitor. Is the SpO2 remaining within the target? Do you still have a stable patient who doesn't have those uh, signs? Then reduce again with another half a liter. Okay, do we still have our SpO2 within target? Is, is our patient still calm without these other signs of increased work of breathing? Then you reduce. Uh, with another half a liter. So it's, you're now weaning off the other one you are titrating up. Now you are weaning off oxygen. 
So once we gotten to the minimum for the gadget, uh, for all the gadget, then it's the time you can stop oxygen. Then always remember to keep checking, especially after one hour of stopping oxygen, you must check the patient because the patient can have late desaturation happening and uh, you don't want that to happen. So remember, if you're to discharge the child who has been on oxygen uh, if, and they have been stable with SpO2 above, equal or above 90 on room air and no increased work of breathing, you need to wait at least for 24 hours with the child not on oxygen as you observe them uh, to make sure that they are fully well before you release them. So this is a, a, a table that is in the new pediatric protocol that is allowing us to, to monitor use of oxygen. Now we have targets for different ages. As you monitor, you're checking those targets. And if you're not achieving the targets, you escalate care, you inc increase the flow rate, you change the gadget, and if need be, you refer the patient uh, for advanced care. Okay, so this uh, just the, the, the reminder of the same. We have our target. Remember, it's uh, increasing the half a liter every half an hour until you get to our target. Change the gadgets if need be. And also when you're reducing, you're reducing at the same rate. Half a liter every half an hour. Change the gadget if need be. And uh, once you've uh, stopped oxygen, observe the patient for one day before you allow them home. Yeah, so this is just still a reminder. So we've said supplemental oxygen does not treat the underlying infection or problem. So always treat the underlying problem. Okay, so, uh, so if there's still hypoxemia or increased work of breathing, uh, persisting despite intervention already we've mentioned then advanced care is needed uh, like mechanical ventilation so just to mention a few uh, issues about uh, this care is just uh, uh, to be able to alert us the patients that we need to escalate care so uh, if the patient um, so it, if you failed on nasoprongs, you failed on an rebreather, the next is advanced care. So it's also now prompting us to always uh, look out for patients you may need to refer because late referrals also affect, um, also affect our care and late referrals lead to pure, poor, poor patient outcomes. Okay, so okay, so patient. Um, so we patient who who may need uh, their care to be escalated. It's patient who remain in respiratory failure. Patient who have uh, or an obstructed airway. Patient who have neuromuscular disorders, patient who may have um, a cardiac problems, so patient with lung collapse. So all these patients may need to be referred. Patient in shock, patient in, with a low uh, uh, coma scale of less than eight. So all these patients need to be referred for for referred early for advanced care. So for the for the support in breathing, so we have non-invasive and invasive support. So non-invasive support <coughs> commonly used in many of our hospitals is CPAP. And some of the CPAP, you just need a source of oxygen or high flow nasal cannula. So also the invasive, uh, support its use of the endotracheal intubation uh, or uh, use of the tracheostomy tubes. 
So this is a chart which uh, helps us to be able to detect. It, it's just what we had done with our titration. So you've titrated your oxygen and you've gotten to an end and then you refer the patient for advanced care. Okay, so if the referred patient uh, for the, they either get into um, invasive support and then thereafter usually win uh, if they meet the criteria for winning and if they have a spontaneous breathing after winning then you it's a, a success then you will now uh, uh, be escalating so you extubate the patient and they can either go to CPAP or to non rebreather and to nasal prongs as another system of weaning off then if they get into failure then they go back into mechanical ventilation so this is just a chart that the pediatric icu teams use to be able to wean off the patient now as they are recovering initially we had started with prongs going this way for prongs and rebreather CPAP then mechanical ventilation. So this one is the recovering patient. How we'll be able to see they'll still need uh, to be able to uh, scale down uh, gradually until they are out of oxygen. So CPAP, we said it's quite common nowadays. It's available in many of our facilities and uh, it, uh, it continuous positive airway pressure. It keeps the lungs open, keeps the alveoli open by providing a continuous gush of air, of air, or blended with oxygen. Okay, so, or, uh, so it's usually have a blender which is giving, mixing oxygen and air so that you varying the concentration, what you call the FiO2, so that you'll be able to provide a measured gush of air so usually given in centimeters of water pressure, usually start at five centimeters of water pressure. So this tube goes into the water, starting at five centimeters. The deeper the tube, the more CPAP you're delivering, the more pressure buildup that you're causing within the tube. So this pressure is regulated so that the baby is still able to breathe. So CPAP, is for babies who are spontaneously breathing, but they need that extra pressure to keep their alveoli open. So CPAP is not for the babies with the very, who are uh, very unwell. So babies who are uh, almost gasping, babies who are quite depressed in their breathing. So, but CPAP is for babies who are spontaneously breathing, but they need that support before they get tired. So, so if, uh, if the alveoli are collapsing with every breath, they use too much energy to open up there. It's like a small balloon to blow it afresh. You need too much energy. But to top up and keep it open, you need less energy. So the same idea works with the sip up and you, you just need this gush of air into the alveoli to keep them open. So CPAP is a, um, it's easy to use in many of our places. And we've seen, we visited a few facilities which have CPAP, but they, they are not able, they are not using them. Maybe people are not trained, but uh, it requires uh, a minimal training, even a one day training, and you are able to apply CPAP and use it well. Monitor the patient, uh, if, and check if they are, they are saturation well, make sure they, are, they don't have any abdominal distension. And keep so CPAP can be used in many of our facilities. So the other non-invasive support is, uh, that can be used in our hospitals is the high flow nasal cannula. So this is a gadget that is able to give high flow rates uh, of oxygen, even 
uh, some deliver even up to 60 liters per minute. But at that rate, the, you have to humidify and warm the oxygen. So these are also used in HDU setup where you need to, uh, or acute room setup where you need to closely monitor the patient. So the other uh, gadget is uh, for mechanical ventilation. Is just that was just to alert us that you may need to escalate care uh, if the patient is not uh, saturating as you had planned. So you that uh, prompt you to refer early for advanced help or refer or consult your pediatrician early enough. So we are now going to look at the complications of oxygen therapy. We said oxygen is a drug and it can have side effects. So we may need to, to be able to prescribe and administer oxygen uh, correctly. So uh, oxygen toxicity does occur and it can affect uh, uh, many blood vessels, many organs. So it can affect the blood vessels, the brain, and even the respiratory system. Okay, so oxygen, within the blood vessels, it can, it causes vasoconstriction, okay, so and this can affect perfusion of organs, especially like the brain. So a lot of oxygen in the body causes the formation of reactive oxygen species, okay, so you've, you've uh, so oxygen is able to react uh, with, with uh, other body substances and form uh, these reactive oxygen chemicals like peroxides which damage the which damage the tissues and the organs and that's how it causes damage to the lungs and damage to the brain so in the lungs the normal tissue it's getting injured inward and eventually the normal tissue is replaced by uh, uh, connective tissue or fibrous tissue so then that's how you had a patient developing pulmonary fibrosis. So in the retina, it also causes retinopathy of prematurity with the same, almost the same similar ways of these overdose of oxygen causing damage to, to, the, to the retina. Okay, so oxygen is a drug and can and causes a damage if given in overdose. So remember to stick to our saturations, okay? So you, as you treat the underlying problem. So also oxygen as underdose causes problems. You need oxygen to make energy uh, for the body. So if you don't have the energy, then all most of the body systems are affected and can even lead to death. Okay, so also, Continuous uh, I, low oxygen in the lungs, continuous hypoxia in the lungs, uh, causes the pulmonary arteries to constrict, and that sustained hypoxic constriction leads to pulmonary hypertension. So you also don't want the patient to remain hypoxic for long. You want to give your oxygen in 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 the right amount, not underdose, not overdose. So it can affect eyes, the oxygen toxicity, the brain, um, muscles, and the lungs. So we've looked at uh, giving this oxygen and we've uh, monitored the oxygen use. We even uh, mentioned the need to give the oxygen at the right dose and now we need to look at the sources of oxygen that are available to our hospitals so that you'll be able to understand where is this oxygen coming from and uh, how to use it uh, um, efficiently. So oxygen comes, uh, we have one of the commonest uh, source of oxygen is the cylinders. Okay, so, uh, so the cylinders are, are filled at some source, and then they can transport it to the, to the ward or to the facility. So the other 
source of oxygen is a concentrator. We have also oxygen plant, and we'll also be able to see bulk oxygen storage. So cylinders are easy for hospitals because um, you don't need electricity to have uh, cylinders, to use cylinders, but now they are cumbersome to transport and they will they, you'll, you'll incur transport cost. Okay, so the, yeah, so you can incur the cost of transport. They, they are not easy to move around. They are also sensitive to leakage and accident. So concentrators, they are also a source of oxygen, but you need to, you, you need to have a steady source of power because without power, there'll be no oxygen, without electricity. So they are not expensive to run. They are not expensive to run. They are movable. Then they, they require, uh, the drawback is that you require an interrupted uh, power supply. You also need to keep servicing them. So which is also a gap in many of our hospitals where uh, you are not monitoring the purity of oxygen you are generating with the concentrator or uh, cleaning the filters and make sure uh, the, the concentrators are working optimally. So yeah, so this, this we've uh, seen the accessories that we need to use the cylinder. So cylinder is uh, often used. In Kenya and most of the Commonwealth, the cylinders that we have for oxygen are black with white shoulders. So this is what we have in Kenya and most of the Commonwealth is black cylinders with white shoulders for oxygen. So other countries have different color codes. I think in the Americas, they use the green uh, cylinders for oxygen and the rest of the world, they use uh, white cylinders for oxygen. So it's for us here in Kenya is we are using black uh, cylinders with white shoulders indicating they contain oxygen. So they are easy to use. Also, it's good to know the amount of oxygen that a cylinder has. So the small cylinder found in the ambulance, it uh, carries about uh, 1,360 liters of oxygen. The middle-sized cylinder, the ones we, we have like in our wards, they, are, they have 3,400 liters. Uh, the bigger cylinders, they are these with 6,800 liters. So usually these 9 kg and 11 kg cylinders, they are good for, to be used centrally. They are difficult to move, they are quite heavy. Uh, so they are good to use in the what you call manifolds. You are going to see them shortly. So, but uh, so these the, these two cylinders, the 1. 1. 1.8 and the 4.6 kg, they are the ones we use mostly to transport to transfer patients with. It's good to note these liters so that we'll be able to know that if you're using 10 liters per minute with an Andre breather, so you are able to estimate how many minutes this cylinder is going to last you. So you've had stories of a uh, patient being referred and oxygen running out uh, along the way. So you'll be able to estimate and get to know if you need an extra cylinder uh, as you transfer uh, your patient. So uh, we've talked of the concentrator is a gadget which can give you a source of oxygen, but you need power, you need servicing. So they are the gross particle filter. These are filter at the back of the, either back or the sides of the concentrator, which needs to be cleaned weekly. It's easy to remove and doesn't require the biomed engineer. So even the people in the clinical area can remove the filter and clean it. So there is also another internal filter, the bacterial filter that requires the biomed to change often and some are changed every six months. So you need to have a system of monitoring and, and making sure that uh, the concentrator is a good source of oxygen but needs servicing. So if you also need to monitor the, 
the the you also need to monitor the the you also need to monitor the the saturation of oxygen also called the purity of oxygen from the concentrator okay so and if if it drops then you need an overhaul and major service for for the and you need major service for the concentrator you need major service for the concentrator so the other oxygen source is the manifold so we need uh, a major we need another oxygen source is the manifold uh, so this system allows uh, many oxygen cylinders to be combined and it has a control panel which uh, switches from one side to the other and allows oxygen even from the cylinders to be combined and piped into uh, a ward or into uh, a hospital unit so this is uh, an oxygen manifold is also a good source of oxygen so uh, we also have the pressure swing uh, um, machines uh, plants these machines uh, these plants they are commonly called the oxygen plants so these oxygen plants the psa plants so these oxygen plants they work like a big oxygen concentrator the same concept what the concentrator does uh, we are told nitrogen is 70 Eight, forms per seventy-eight percent of air, and both the concentrator and this uh, PSA plant, they remove the nitrogen from air, and you're left mostly with oxygen. So this oxygen is pumped into the containers uh, for storage. So the oxygen comes from air, and it is uh, it is stored in these containers. So this oxygen is pressurized and can be even put into into cylinders so it works like a big big uh, it works like a big concentrator and can be a source for oxygen for hospitals the same drawbacks with uh, as they were with um, with the concentrator you need a steady source of power to run this plant you need servicing especially the servicing part you need frequent uh, servicing and replacement of the parts that are getting worn out. Yeah, so that, that uh, becomes a, a challenge sometimes to our facilities to service the equipment. And then the oxygen can be piped from this plant to the, to the wards. So the other uh, source of oxygen is the liquid, bulk liquid oxygen. Uh, and usually it's a storage so oxygen is uh, uh, it's manufactured uh, by a different system from uh, the industries or the um, uh, from the factories. They use the cooling. They cool the air until they it 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 they use it leaves like a form of distillation. So different gases. Um, you can say they boil at different uh, different temperatures, so they are able to cool the gases and be able to separate gases depending on the temperatures that they are getting into liquid forms. So, so nitrogen will uh, get into liquid form at a different uh, temperature with with the, with oxygen. Okay, so uh, so that that that's the system. This bulk liquid oxygen. The advantage for that is that it gives you the liquid oxygen. You know, it is pure oxygen, hundred percent. So it's pure oxygen, and it's um, it's what is brought in by a tanker, and it's pump. It flows into a liquid tank. So this liquid tank, uh, we usually see this. Uh, vents which look like a radiator so these vents they are now uh, warming the oxygen so that it can evaporate from 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 liquid form into gaseous form 
so that it can be now pumped into the ward. So we usually have the liquid oxygen, uh, which is uh, brought in uh, from the supplier and it is stored into a tank. And this oxygen moves into this warming uh, radiator-like uh, uh, vaporizers. So these vaporizers is to convert the liquid into, into, into gaseous form of, of oxygen. So usually when uh, a liquid is turning from one form to the other, it absorbs heat also. So that way it's find some form of ice uh, covering this, covering these uh, vaporizers as they as they are able to 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 absorb the heat as they are converting the oxygen from liquid form to so it's usually the ice that is usually uh, on this because the oxygen here in the liquid tank is under very low temperature. So these one, these um, vaporizers are warming it so that it can be ready to be piped to the oxygen. So that's why oxygen is still cool by the time it gets to the patient. So that's why some machines will have a system of warming and humidifying the oxygen, especially those which are using invasive uh, methods of delivering oxygen. That's why they, they have, these also have the, the uh, another level of warming and humidifying the oxygen so that it can be comfortable to administer to the patient. So uh, oxygen supports burning a lot. So oxygen support combustion. So, uh, so our last part here is just to look at the uh, general safety measures that we need to observe as we handle oxygen because uh, we've had a few uh, inc incidences in some of our hospitals where oxygen was involved, uh, even causing injuries. Uh, so another general precaution, especially in children, uh, do not exceed the recommended flow rates. So you can lead to gastric inflation and cause damage and cause, in and cause harm to the patient. Also make sure that the patient gets the prescribed feeds, do not overfeed <clears throat> or um, even give excessive uh, uh, fluids. This, this should be for all the patient, but especially the patient who are quite unwell and on oxygen, you still don't want to overload them. So you remember the fire triangle, oxygen is a big part of the oxygen triangle where oxygen supports combustion, oxygen supports burning. So you just need an ignition and a source of fuel and, and, and uh, something to burn. You just need an ignition and something to burn. And that's what we are calling a fuel. And you have a fire. And if the oxygen is there continuously, it's a fire that you cannot control. So we want to make sure that uh, we break the, the chain where we remove the heat, we remove the oxygen, and we separate it from uh, something that can buy, can, that can burn. So to reduce fire risk, always put a uh, no smoking sign at where the oxygen is stored or oxygen is handled. So avoid naked flames, sparks, and static electricity around oxygen. So never use oil and grease. So any hydrocarbons, petrol, grease, oil, they burn very easily, especially if you have oxygen. So if you have um, these oils and grease uh, and oxygen, you just need a very tiny, tiny trigger and you love a fire. So always make sure that also your hands are free from oil and lotion. Always wash hands. Uh, apart from infection prevention here, yeah, you're also washing your hands to remove any excess oils and lotions as you handle oxygen. Again, you need a small amount of ignition once you have the oil and oxygen and you love a fire. So that means we need to close cylinder valves when they are not in use. And any leakage is supposed to be reported so that uh, 
we not endanger ourselves. So other ways um, is a storage of the cylinders. So if you see this such kind of picture is common in, in, it can be seen in some of our facilities. Always make sure that uh, cylinders are correctly stored. Um, so not lying um, down all over. So this can cause damage to the valves. So you, you don't want this to happen. So, okay, also, also it's idea, ideally cylinders are supposed to be stored uh, outdoors away from the major buildings. And also you store the empty cylinders separate from the full ones. So that uh, makes work easier for everyone. So, and also the empty ones fall more easily. So in case they fall and they knock off a full one, it becomes a blast. So you also want to, as much as possible, store your cylinders in upright position. So do not carry people the same compartment with oxygen cylinder, but in case of an ambulance, make sure that your oxygen uh, cylinder has a special uh, place where it is kept and it is secured, okay? So we said uh, always make sure that cylinders are uh, secured as you transport them. So also remove uh, the gas cylinders from the vehicle immediately on arrival uh, to the destination and secure them appropriately. Always use a trolley when you're moving this, this, the cylinder and it damages your cylinder to drag them on the ground. So other do's and don'ts, okay, always read the labels and the instructions on the cylinder. Do not remove any markings or interfere with any labels on the cylinder. So some cylinders have to go back to the manufacturer for testing after some time. And when you interfere with these labels, people may not know when to take back the cylinders for, for checking. So always use a trolley, we said. Uh, so make sure the cylinders are not near a source of heat. So on, always make sure the cylinders are uh, turned off. So we also, cylinders are made of uh, steel. Uh, it, do not use them near MRI systems. They can be attracted by the magnet and can cause injuries and damage your equipment. So report any gas leaking in the cylinder or from our oil socket. Okay, so do not cover any piping signage. And so in, 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 in case you have piped oxygen, do not interfere with the piping. Okay. So do not cover them, do not paint over them. So let the, the pipes remain the way they are. So always enhance ventilation if a leak is detected, open nearby windows to lower the oxygen concentration. Do regular checks to the piping, do the regular checks. So in case of a fire, always sound an alarm, uh, activate an evacuation plan. Do not attempt to fight the fire uh, on your own. So, and then you can turn off any electrical uh, system, especially those linked to oxygen sources. So uh, oxygen cylinders, they can explode, especially if the fire starts. So you don't want to fire, to fight the fire for so long. You don't know when you'll have an explosion. So in case of a fire, uh, you, it's better to be safe. It's better to be safe and always uh, prevention is better. So check out, always secure the cylinder. So we have uh, these cylinders which are on, on the floor. So you have these cylinders which are on the wood and these cylinders, they are not secured and they can easily fall and injure uh, the people around there. So also in case you need 
uh, strapping, some of the strapping have oils which can be flammable. So, and other chemicals which can be flammable. So do not use strapping. We said by the time you're using strapping, there's something wrong. So you need to report the leak and have the, the equipment checked. You, then finally, a document on oxygen therapy and uh, most of our vital charts, they give you a place to record oxygen saturation, to record the oxygen flow rate that you're delivering, to also record um, the respirations of the patient and other vital signs. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. I can now go to the Q&A session. Thank you, Jason. That was comprehensive. At least now we have the new update on oxygen therapy management and especially to our children. Now it is more clear about oxygen toxicity. It is more clear now that it is no longer about it is no longer about just administering oxygen. We know now the protocols that we need to observe when we are giving oxygen. Aha, I can see there are three questions. One of the question is asking, while well, using an unrebreather, are we supposed to humidify that using instilled water, distilled water? Yes, a uh, non rebreather is giving high flow rate oxygen. So for high flow rate, we've seen you need to humidify using distilled water. Distilled water is the best. And remember always to change the water every day. Okay, so change the water every day. Then wash the bottle thoroughly when the patient is out of oxygen for use by the next patient. Wash and dry. So we are using distilled water. And yes, you need to humidify oxygen when you're using high flow gadget and non rebreather is one of them. Thank you so much, Jason. The other person is asking, during the review, do we take the SpO2 of oxygen in room air? So SpO2 can be used for checks, uh, so or can be used for continuous monitoring. So if your patient is not on continuous monitoring, you can you may not need to uh, take you may not need to have the SpO2 on the patient throughout, especially if they, they don't need oxygen. So you can be able to 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 do the periodic check as you do the vitals. So you can also be checking the oxygen saturation. But for patient on room air who is not on continuous monitoring, you don't need to have the SPO2 on throughout. Thank you. The other question is the difference between the cylinder, cylinder oxygen and electric oxygen machine. What is the difference? Uh, so the manufacturer supplies the two separate. So you have the industrial oxygen, Sometimes they may have the same color, but they label one for industrial, the other one is for medical use. Thank you so much. So many comments about the presentation that was very informative. Many people appreciate, others are requesting for the soft copy, they'll get back to you. Apart from removal of clothing, and enhancing ventilation, is there any other management of kerosene poisoning in children before considering administration of oxygen? So the danger, I think what I remember about kerosene poisoning is that the danger is the aspiration that occurs leading to very bad chemical pneumonitis. So this patient will get a bad pneumonia, that's the problem and you may need to refer them to a place where they may need to get the advanced care. So they may need to even intubation because of the pneumonitis. So the problem is the pneumonitis that occur due to the aspiration of the kerosene. 
excellent presentation. There is a new practice where the non-repreather mask, the reseller is tied. Is this good practice? So it's not good practice because you need it free so that it can be able to store the oxygen that the patient will be taking in with every breath. So you don't need to tie it. It needs to be inflated and full because as the patient is breathing in, they're drawing the oxygen from the reservoir bag. So there's no need of reducing that size or tie. So yeah, so it's, it's not a correct practice. Thank you so much. There was another comment, I think it has disappeared. They were asking in the priority signs, they were looking at poisoning and they thought that organophosphate should be put in the emergency sign. What is your comment? Yeah, so that is under the triage in the new protocol. So usually if the patient is very unwell, they'll have the emergency signs. They'll have uh, uh, an airway that is not patent. Maybe they'll have secretions. They'll have breathing, which is already affected. But we all know always start with the, with the emergency signs being the ABCs, D. So if the patient will have coma or confusion, then they're already emergency. If they'll have respiratory distress, they'll already be emergency. So this is any poisoning which doesn't present with the emergency signs, then they are the ones prioritized. Somebody is stable, not in any immediate danger, but there was some form of history of poisoning, then they are seen as emergency. But in case the person has any, uh, any emergency, mostly if they have severe poisoning, uh, they'll also have uh, emergency signs in terms of the ABCD. So you, yeah, so that I uh, was thought of, and I think it's captured in, in, so that to be able to remind us to always also uh, check out for any possible poisoning and ask if there was a history of any poison. Thank you so much. On oxygen management for newborn and children with dyspnea, once oxygen, how does it affect the eyes? So we've talked about oxygen toxicity and we have said this excessive oxygen, it's uh, causing formation of the, they're called reactive oxygen species like, uh, like uh, peroxides. Peroxides are com compounds which have, they are chemicals which have uh, oxygen as part of them. And the more oxygen you have, the more of these chemicals that you're going to form. And they're the ones which injure the, especially for the small babies, they injure the retina and can lead to blindness. Thank you so much, Jason, for the elaborate answers. Many people are saying very informative session, blessings, thank you so much. Any other question that has been left out? Any other question? Okay, thank you all for being also a good audience. We had good numbers, thank you. I Back think to you. we come to the end of our today's sessions. Look out for more sessions in nursing series on what we are doing on the ground. You are all welcome. Thank you. Thank you.